more questions. Yes, please. So my question is about humor. And the first part of it is for Brad, and then I'm going to open it up. But um, so you were saying that when you first wrote Human Remains and you were like the script, you were putting it out there, people looked at it and said it wasn't funny, and it wasn't until it came off the page. Yeah. So I'm wondering, did you know that it was funny? Or you did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, all that takes is hearing it. And so much difference can be made with a play between reading it yourself or hearing it. And hearing it is the way it should happen. And sadly, as money gets tighter and as all our resources start to dwindle up and things, uh, we don't get readings of plays very much anymore. We don't get workshops. I mean, I have to hire people myself or bring them over, guilt them into it, to, to hear my play. And, and it's ridiculous because if you don't hear the play, it's not a play, and it won't be until it is heard. A play will never be a play as it's being read by someone silently. It has to be heard. It has to exist in the air, in space, and that's really a difficult thing to do. And again, what I tell the young playwrights all the time, the new playwrights, is get your friends together and hear the play, because as soon as you hear it, it's a whole different experience. Have a pizza reading. Have a pizza reading, exactly. And also what I suggest too to first time writers is get the actors to read it that you think are perfect for it. Because if, if you get the actor, you think, well, that's the guy. He's going to be perfect for this role. And they read something and it's not working, then it's not because he's not the right actor. You can't use that excuse anymore. Yeah, although if you're a little more experienced, my advice is always <laughs> for those first particularly public readings, get the get wrong, the wrong actors. Yeah, yeah. Because good actors will make Everything, everything work and sound great. Less early, less bright actors will point out immediately where all the deficiencies are. So that's why sometimes having the best person for the role from the very beginning is not a service to the playwright. Being able to not only hear the play, but also hear the play publicly and hear the play with the wrong people are all really important parts of the process of, of writing and particularly rewriting. But if you're young, if you're just starting out, then don't make excuses. If you hear that first meeting, it's like, oh, no, I, I just didn't get the right, right actor. It's like, no, I'm sorry, kid. Sorry. Uh, when, I, when I got started in this wacky business years ago, and I wrote a, I wrote a, a full-scale native comedy that I like to say it's just a sheer celebration of the Aboriginal sense of humor with no socially redeeming qualities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It was called The Bootlegger Blues, and it's about a 58-year-old good Christian Ojibwe woman who through a series of circumstances finds herself in possession of 143 cases of beer that she has to bootleg to buy an organ for the church. <laughs> and it's based on a true story. <laughs> and it was produced by a native theater company and then toured to native communities and urban environments like with a strong native core, like at the Native Canadian Center here. And it did very, very well. A couple of years later, I get a phone call from a, shall I say, white theater company, mainstream theater company, we said, we read your play, we'd like to produce it. This is Port Dover Lighthouse Theater down on Lake Erie. And um, for people who are unfamiliar with, let's just say the clientele, has, their hair has largely a bluish tint. <laughs> and they produced it. And so we went down there for the whole show. Um, and I'm there with the actors and all this sort of stuff. And we rehearse it. We go on stage, opening night. My comedy is up. I'm all set to have a good time. Oh, no. Curtain goes up. Oh, no. Native comedy, absolute silence. Oh. Off in a distance, we hear coyotes howling. <laughs> Tumbleweeds went across the stage. And I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, you know, I was all excited. I thought, oh, good, white money. Um, but and the actors were doing a great job. The director had done a fabulous job. His face, and the writing was brilliant. <laughs> but nobody was laughing. And this is in 1993. And this is during a period of time that I guess you could say was at the height of the political correctness era where you had this entire population of people who had been taught what what horrible things had happened to Native people. There's poor Native people, the tragic Native people, the Stoic Indians, all these different things. <clears throat> and here was a comedy, which a Native comedy, which at that time was an oxymoron. And so they're sitting there watching this comedy and having absolutely no idea how to react. Because this was before Dead Dog Cafe, before anything else had come out. But the interesting thing is, Two of the actors from the play uh, were from a community 20 minutes away from Port Dover, the largest Native community in Canada, a place called Six Nations. In every performance, there were six, six to ten people from Six Nations 
who were related to the actors, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, parents, whatever, were sitting up there and see 311 people. Nobody was laughing, all except for eight people <laughs> in the back laughed through. Now, what was really interesting was well, I watched them, right? Because I was thinking, here goes my career up in smoke. <laughs> and so for the first five minutes, nobody's laughing except these eight people. And then the circle of white people around them started to laugh. And then another five minutes, the next circle started to laugh. And it was like throwing a rock in a pond. The circle got bigger. And what was happening is the audience was waiting for permission yeah. to laugh. And once they realized the Native people are laughing at it, we're supposed to laugh at it, um, it beat its off box office projection. I've had like four other plays there. But it's really interesting watching, paying attention to your audience and what, humor-wise, what they'll laugh at and what they won't laugh at. And somebody who's Native like me, I write jokes sometimes that are specifically for Native people, specifically for white people, but 90% of it is true humor is universal. What makes us laugh will make you laugh. What makes you laugh will make us laugh. There's no particularly native way to boil an egg.